Constance Hall is a gutter trash hippie who deserves to die. Constance Hall looks like a walking venereal disease. Do Australia a favour and kill yourself, you fat pig. Why don't you show us all what suicide looks like? You can smell Constance Hall half an hour before you see her. Hi. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Constance Hall. <laughs> I've been blogging since before blogging was called blogging, sharing my truth with the world for over 15 years. I realized a long time ago that I've got a gift for making people laugh by being excruciatingly honest. When I was young, I would travel the world, and we didn't have social media back then, so we had to collect email addresses. And I'd collect everyone's, from the guy that served me at Flight Centre to a lady I applied for a job with in a bar. I'd save them all up and I'd share everything, from my travels to my heartbreak to my love of cheesecake. And I would hit send to all. And before I knew it, hundreds and hundreds of people were following my journey. I've written posts that did pretty well, you know, like 80,000 likes and 10,000 shares. But I was still a fairly anonymous blogger until I wrote a post in 2016 called Parent Sex about the lackluster reality of trying to squeeze a shag in while your kids are in the next room with their list of demands. <laughs> Now, that post reached over 20 million people. <laughs> I think we can safely call it relatable. <laughs> it was like a viral sigh of relief. Women were tagging their husbands in it, going, see, it's not just us whose sex lives suck. <laughs> And we all laughed at our perfectly imperfect, newly defined, passionate sex lives. I lack the embarrassment that stops a lot of people from being vulnerable. If you wanted to hear a birth story, I'd tell you about my anal tear and the time I pooed on my hot doctor. You want to hear about relationships? I'll, I'll confess to you that I don't feel lovable or know what I'm doing half the time. I'll show you my tummy and not just the smooth top bit. You'll see the fat patch that sits above my vagina and would make an excellent pillow if anyone dared to go near the life-creating jungle. <laughs> <laughs> All on Facebook. <laughs> He owned it. <laughs> For everybody to see. And then you guys. You guys started showing me yours. When I learned about your third hemorrhoid that you named Fred, <laughs> and the fact that your sister just slept with your husband and you couldn't tell anybody. And we cried and we laughed. We stopped taking ourselves so bloody seriously as we remembered how much we desperately missed woman-to-woman -woman connection. My blog was growing by 5,000 people a day. I could not fart without the Daily Mail writing a story about me. Ashton Kutcher, George Taki were sharing my posts. Ellen DeGeneres had me on Ellen Tube. Whoopi Goldberg spoke about me on The View and how she agrees with my sentiments that swearing around your kids really isn't that bad. <laughs> <laughs> I went from being a woman holding one baby, pushing the other baby in the pram, screaming at my kid to get off the road, the other one to get back on his skateboard attachment, all in the supermarket while just trying to buy some bloody pads. So pretty much being the exact same woman doing the exact same things, but I am now stopped for an average of eight selfies by women who love me and everything that I stood for. My blog had over a million followers. Every publisher in the country wanted to sign me. They were offering me the highest end of advances. We're talking about a woman who's written her whole life and never been published. If anyone ever bothered to get back to me, and I think two publishers did, it was something like, that was really entertaining, but we could never ever publish such raw content. And here I was, with this platform of my own, loyal, loving, eager readers, lapping up every single word I wrote. I called them my queens. <laughs> yeah, girls. And I was living a dream. Kind of. There was one thing I wasn't sharing with the world. Amongst all this love and dreams turned into reality, I became a victim of severe bullying. Soul-destroying, shame-inducing, career-ending bullying. You can call it online bullying, but that just minimizes it. 
compartmentalizing it as if, as if we could simply step offline to eradicate it. But in 2019, you can't live offline. You can't Skype your kids, order an Uber, claim welfare, get a job offline. In 2016, the United Nations declared internet access as a basic human right, as essential to daily living as safe education, safe transport, but we're not safe online. Online, offline, bullying's bullying, and we need to judge it by the effects it has on the victims instead of the medium it's used to attack. Within a few short months of becoming a household name, comments about me went from 95% supportive to 95% abusive. My Facebook was hacked, friends' Facebooks were hacked, hate groups formed, there's thousands, 6,000 members in them with names like the dethroning of Constance Hall. And anyone who knew anything about me was welcomed into these groups and groomed into spilling or making up something that could destroy me. Time and time again, my heart would break as I would learn about a new attack set on me. At dinner with my kids, my family, mouth full of food about to reach my lips, my phone lit up, I looked down, it was an admin who works on my page. She was messaging to tell me that one of my trolls had now printed out photos of me and plastered them big posters all over my hometown with the slogan, vote for Constance Hall as the number one shit mother of the year. The food I was enjoying now repulsed me and the restaurant gasped as I raced to the toilet to vomit. I was so alone. I was more alone than I've ever been. And the food splashed the toilet bowl, wetting my already mascara-covered face. People were telling me to kill myself in reputable news articles. Men and women were saying they hope I die in childbirth. All receiving the virtual high five of hundreds of likes. It appeared that the more isolated and alone I felt, the more they could enjoy the luxury of connection. It was pitchfork connection, but it's connection nonetheless. And I tried to get help. I reached out to doctors and therapists, agents, publicists, even celebrities, and everyone had the same advice. Rise above. You need to ignore it. And I tried so incredibly hard, but it occurred to me there's something wrong with me because I cannot ignore this. And I was terrified and I was ashamed to admit, but I was drowning. I could no longer write with the freedom and passion that I was loved for. My tone was guarded and defensive when I conjured the strength to write it all. I found things, embarrassing things that I'd said or done years ago and sent them to the media and the media was constantly asking me for a quote on something I couldn't even remember doing, but I probably did. <laughs> I found out that an old friend with mental health issues was in my hate groups, exposing my phone number, saying my children needed DNA tests. And I didn't know who I could trust. And all the while, everyone just kept saying to me, it's not real, Con. It's only real if you let it be. But one person understood bullies trade in shame and isolation. I was embarrassed and I was alone. I moved to the country hoping to buy myself a little bit of freedom, but things only magnified. And I realized that this hatred now follows you at every turn. There is no escaping bullying anymore. I could not escape. And for the first time in my life, I found myself Googling the easiest ways to die. I saved up all my Valium. I researched cliff tops in my hometown, the town I was attacked in the most. I let out hints to people that loved me, but they dismissed me as being dramatic. But as a grown woman who has never been clinically depressed or had any suicidal ideations, for months all I thought about was dying. I even rationalised that my kids were resilient and they'd be okay. I used suicide as my defence against the indefensible. I would lie in my bed, 
terrified by every message on my phone, every knock at my door, felt like this troll apocalypse edging closer and closer towards me. But it never quite reached. I met a, met a cute man at the skate park. <laughs> we both had long, knotty hair, were covered in tats, and neither of us were wearing shoes. <laughs> We shared a beer, we shared our stories, and soon enough we were sharing our lives. I now know that I married a man who saved my life. His love for me was impenetrable. He relentlessly built up what they continually broke, and he laughed in the face of the bullies. The first time my husband ever saw the real effects that this bullying was having on me, he walked into the bathroom shocked to find me crouched on the floor. The poison written about me had given me an anxiety attack that ached in my stomach and it choked my chest and it made my hands shake. And he picked me up and he dragged me to the beach. And he made me wear the world's most unflattering wetsuit, snorkel, goggles. And he took me underwater for this beautiful, silent slideshow of another world. He thought he was cleverly distracting me and taking me to a place that the trolls couldn't reach. He didn't realize that he was loving me back to life, that this bullying kept my life on the edge of a cliff and his love just stopped me from ever falling. There is no studies you can read. There's no books you can read. We had nothing but each other. I had the unconditional love of this man and we began to take everything one day at a time. And then one day, I was asked to appear on Australia's Dancing with Stars. <laughs> it was a surprise to everyone that I accepted. <laughs> but I had been, I had been asked to do a lot of reality TV before, except I always said no, because everybody knows that's just asking for more attacks and more hate. However, now, what did I have to lose? Everyone already hates me. The whole country already hated me, and I saw it as an opportunity to shine some light on Rafiki Mwema, the charity I work with. So I guess I also thought somewhere deep inside me that if mainstream media valued me, then maybe I couldn't be this disgusting fat pig that should go and kill herself. You don't hear people talk about credible media identities the way that they spoke about me. So... With the support of my family, I slapped on some heels and I signed the contract. And then the news broke. And radio announcers laughed. The kindest things said about me were never heard of a bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> the cruelest things said about me I couldn't possibly repeat here. And once again, I was reminded that I am alone. No one could guide this woman through a world that she's not safe. No one can protect you. All of the advice that I received was redundant because telling anybody to ignore being systematically abused every day by thousands of people is like telling a child who's getting kicked in the face on her way to school every day to ignore it. You don't have any place advising anyone on anything, let alone these major personal safety issues. So in January 2019, against everybody's advice, I made a video. I spoke about the abuse, the suicidal ideation it had left me with. I quoted the most humiliating comments. I said, it's not okay to tell young people to ignore being bullied. It's not okay to tell them to just rise above. If this grown woman with millions of followers, a loving husband, children, a successful company can't ignore it, what are we expecting of these kids? Youths don't always do as we say. They imitate us. They see our behavior online and that tells them what's okay. That tells them how you can treat people. I hit post and I took my sorry ass to bed. And I woke up in the morning to thousands of messages. I don't usually read because I'm quite numb to it. But that was before I saw. 7.16 a.m., 15-year-old Jasmine. Constance, my nickname at school is Pooh Smear. 
the kids laugh at me every day. I cry myself to sleep. I don't want to wake up in the mornings and I don't have anyone to talk to about it. Thank you so much for sharing your story. I now know I'm not alone. And 13-year-old Jonathan. Hi, Constance. There are hate groups about me where my face is photoshopped in the most embarrassing pictures. Everyone at my school teases me. I can't tell my teachers, and if I tell my mum, she'll blame herself. Thank you for showing me I'm not alone and standing up for us. And a young girl whose nickname is Stubby, because she passed out at a party and was sexually assaulted with a bottle, and everyone thought it was funny. And to this day, the kids at school are still calling her Stubby. And more, there was thousands, thousands more. Humiliated kids, humiliated adults, helpless parents, they're all messaging me. I've always known that taking the loneliness out of a problem has healing benefits. I understood that my suffering was now helping these children. But what I didn't understand was what was happening to me. I didn't want to give up anymore. I turned on the news sites. My supporters now knew how hurt I was and all the hatred and vitriol that was spat about me was met with comments of love and kindness. They weren't tearing the bullies down, making the problem worse. They were just giving me support and showing up for me. I learned that we won't combat bullying by hating bullies. We'll combat bullying by loving victims. Empowering the bully's toxic cycle of anger will do nothing for the victims. We need to shift our focus back to who this is really about. And if the currency of bullying is shame and isolation, let's replenish the victims with love and connection. You don't have to agree with the victims. You don't even have to like them. But you do have to join me and end this culture of silently standing by while bullies torment victims online. A simple hashtag, be kind, it's standing up and it could save a life. Suicide is now one of the leading causes of death amongst young people. And the latest studies have proven that at least half of those deaths are caused by bullying. In the last 12 years, teen suicide and teens' access to digital technology have risen together in scary parallels. It's not your fault that you're living in this fatal bullying epidemic. But it's your responsibility to end it. You can end it if you just realize how powerful you are. I need Jasmine, 15-year-old Jasmine, to know how powerful she is. She got me out of bed. She made me fight on. We can turn this digital culture of tolerated hate into a safe and accountable community. Today I'm free. The sun shines on me and the clouds have passed. And I write passionately once again. I create art. I connect women by sharing every weird little gross detail about my life online once again. <laughs> because you guys showed up for me. There are still so many hate groups and thousands of comments about me but it's followed by this army of love. It is not the job of the victim to keep themselves safe online. It is our job to keep them safe online. Believe it or not, thousands of people are still trying to convince the world that I stink. 
which I don't. <laughs> and I don't care anymore because I have the love of you guys. So now, let's do what we can't rely on our leaders to do. And in the name of every victim that was lost and let down by this system, every life lost too young, let us pledge that we won't stand by in silence anymore. Thank you.